Um, Today concludes our series on the Sermon of the Mount. Um, Over the last seven weeks, um, Jesus has been reshaping our worldview. Um, As people saved by Christ, as people brought into his family, um, Jesus now calls us to adopt his radical vision and values for the world. Um, We've seen that following Jesus means um, that we humble ourselves, we become poor in spirit, Um, We've seen the great impact that we should have on the world as salt and light working for the good of the world around us. Um, We've seen the complete consistency and the complete love that we need to bring to all our relationships, all the way into the heart. And Jesus says, actually, following me is so urgent, it's so precious um, that it transcends even our most basic needs in life, like money, food, and clothing. Um, And as you read Matthew 5 to 7 you realize that Jesus' teachings are superb. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi said that the Sermon of the Mount delighted me beyond measure. It gave me comfort and boundless joy. Even our world um, heralds the Sermon of the Mount. Um, Even atheists say that the um, the Sermon of the Mount is the most sublime, the most benevolent code of morals which has ever been offered. But if this is all it does, if all the Sermon on the Mount does is inspire you, if all it does is fill you with admiration, then you have absolutely no idea what it's about. No, these aren't just thought-provoking words to put at the back of a coffee mug. No, these words ultimately bring you to a decision. This sermon might... Uh, make you feel uncomfortable today. Um, And if it does, it will do its job. Um, And as I read, as as I studied this passage, that's exactly what it did to me. Um, So your job today is to test what I say against Scripture, because if these are Jesus' words, we must take them seriously. So let's pray as we begin. Father, humble us today to receive your word as it is, to take a sober mind um, and apply it against your scriptures. Please help us, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, every day um, we're confronted with decisions. Uh, Some decisions are small, like should I get soy milk or full cream milk with my coffee? Um, Although it can feel slightly a bigger decision if you're lactose intolerant, like maybe 80% of us here. Um, Some decisions are really big, like uh, what job should I take? Who should I marry? Um, uh, What course should I study? These decisions can change the trajectory of our lives. And of course, some decisions are enormous. For instance, yes, so who should I marry? Two people who fundamentally come together, they change their life and they become one flesh. Um, Hopefully, my wife Nat doesn't regret this decision after just seven months. But Jesus says, there's one singular decision that transcends everything. Because this decision, Jesus says, determines not just your life, but your eternity. There are two categories of people in the world that really matter. Those who follow Jesus and those who don't. And at the end of history, we'll be defined and we'll be divided according to this reality. Jesus says that the life-altering truths found in this sermon leave us with one life-altering choice. So today we'll see three pictures of this choice. We'll see two gates, two trees, and two houses. Jesus begins with two gates in verse 13. He says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction." And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. It's a very simple picture. Two paths leading to two gates. The first path is wide. Lots of people get into this path. It's easy to be on this path. Of course, this is the path of the majority. In Australia, we're governed by a democracy. So the majority opinion wins. But that's not how it works in the kingdom of God. 
The path that's wide, Jesus says, is the one that leads to destruction. You know, when we think of the narrow path, sometimes we think of this beautiful field with meadows around leading to this quaint little wooden gate. But in reality, the path looks a little bit more like this. It's unpleasant, it's claustrophobic, it's hemming you in. It's the harder way, it's often the lonely way. I was born in um, Australia and sadly I can only speak English. I tried so hard in high school to learn Mandarin, I tried to learn German. Later on I tried to learn ancient Greek, I tried to learn ancient Hebrew. It was all too hard, I don't know why I tried them all. You see, English was easy, it was natural. And all the other languages for me, they just required such a conscious decision of the will that it eventually just broke me. It absolutely broke me, I couldn't do it. And that's what following Jesus can feel like. To live so well, and not just to live well, but to think well, to have pure motivations, even towards those who hurt you. It's unnatural, right? It's hard. Jesus calls us to live values that are so countercultural. It won't come impulsively. No, Jesus says, this is the narrow path that I call you to. And of course, to the watching world, this Christian worldview, our beliefs look like a joke. You're telling me that Jesus is the only way. How narrow-minded of you. You believe that marriage should be between a man and a woman. How backwards. And of course, you oppose abortion laws. How anti-women's rights you are. If you travel this path, says Jesus, because it's unpopular. Now, of course, as Christians, we don't do these things to make lives miserable. We do these things because we follow Jesus with this conviction that living His way leads to human flourishing, not just for us, but for the world. So the reason we insist on the exclusive truth of Christ is because Jesus says, this is the path to life. This is, wh- this is what we want for people. The reason we believe in marriage between a man and a woman is not to deny people love, but because we believe that living according to God's design for relationships is God's solution for a flourishing society. And of course, the reason we oppose abortion is because of our conviction that all humans, whether in the womb or not, they are all made in God's image. They all carry an inherent dignity, an inherent worth that demands protection. No, you can't discern God's way by looking to the majority. Uh, Many times Christians stand against the majority, and at that time they are viewed as fools, they are viewed as radicals. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, he was a German pastor, he was a theologian during the Nazi regime. And Bonhoeffer, against the majority which, which supported oppression and fascism, he stands in resistance to the Nazis, he opposes Hitler, he condemns genocide. And of course, Bonhoeffer is later, um, he's later um, put to death for an attempted assassination on Hitler. See, the world look, looks back now and they admire Bonhoeffer for his courage. But remember, at the time, against the majority, he is considered a madman, he is considered an agitator against the Nazis. He's the crazy one in society, actually. Yet in the face of opposition, he chooses the narrow path. And the narrow path costs him his life. Bonhoeffer famously writes, When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. For some of us, choosing Christ means um, losing our earthly family who might disown you for your beliefs. It might mean looking really silly in front of your friends for your strange beliefs. It is hard. It is unnatural. I remember speaking to one of my friends um, who was a campus worker, working, um, sharing the gospel with people um, at universities. And I remember asking him, what is the hardest thing about your job? What is the very hardest thing? And he replied to me, honestly, the hardest thing is just for once, I just want to be normal. I just want to fit in for once. 
Do I always have to be the weird one? And I felt for him. I'm sure you can feel for him too. The narrow path is hard. Yet this is the path that leads to life, says Jesus. I want us to be very clear here though. Jesus is not saying that if we obey him, he lets us into heaven. He's not saying that. It's not works righteousness. But he is saying that the litmus test of a true Christian, of someone who's truly been transformed, is an obedience that perseveres. Salvation, yes, is by faith alone, but true faith always produces obedience that lasts. You know, some people say to me, yeah, Christians, they just need a God because it gives you hope. It gives you something to believe in. It makes you feel a little bit better. But notice Jesus says the opposite. This is not therapy. Following me is the harder way. Um, theologian Don Carson, he has a really helpful illustration um, through two cones. And often the first cone is, this is how we often view Christianity, that we make it very easy for people to join, we make it sound great at the start, and then more and more as we start living this way, we find it harder and harder to live His way. He hems us in and eventually we want out. But look at how Jesus paints the Christian life. He, doesn't, he puts everything up front, He says, it will be hard. I'm not going to lie, it will be hard. But what you find as you live out this Christian life is this growing sense of joy, this growing sense of freedom that ultimately will lead you to eternal life. Um, G.K. Chesterton um, says that the, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. This second picture that Jesus gives us is two trees. And these trees represent the difference between fake and real. Have a look at verse 15. Beware of false prophets, false teachers, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Things aren't always as they seem, right? Um, I remember I used to play a lot of golf, and um, we had this phrase to describe certain golfers, which was all gear, no idea. Um, you might know the type, right? Like These were people that had all, all the best golf gear, they bought all the, all the best shoes, the best clothes, the best equipment, but they had absolutely no idea how to play. They bought the best, the latest and greatest equipment. You, from the outside, you would think they were the pros. But when they played, it was a deeply distressing experience. You see, these false teachers come, they don't look coming dodgy, do they? They come with this air of legitimacy, with wolves in sheep's clothing. False teachers even come, in verse 21, in pure doctrine. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Notice that these false teachers, they confess that Jesus is Lord. This is orthodox belief. This is Bible college stuff. And notice they're passionate about it. It's not just Lord. It's Lord, Lord. But Jesus says a true teacher is more than just preaching good doctrine with passion. But to identify a true teacher, you need to observe one's life. Do they obey the will of the Father? one who's humble, one who's teachable, one who pursues purity, who values reconciliation. Are they a person of their word, one who loves the unlovable? If they don't, don't let them into your pulpit. Don't read their books. Don't listen to their podcasts. Why? Because we become who we follow. So judge us by this standard too. Judge us here. We're grateful for accountability through the elders. We're so grateful for your participation at this church. We're grateful for this church that will hold us accountable, not just for our doctrine, but for our lives. And in Jesus' day, in, in verse 16, from a distance, the trees all look very similar. 
but it's when the tree actually bears fruit, it is patently obvious which is which. Jesus says it's only when you survey one's life up really, really close. Then and only then will you really know the substance of your faith. This goes for us too. We're a church that's committed to the Bible. Every week we sit under the exposition of Scripture. Every week we attend life groups where we unpack and apply Scripture to our lives. We meet one-to-one for discipleship, for accountability and support. By all, by all accounts, we believe all the right things. We say all the right things. But ultimately, what reveals our true allegiance is not our words but our obedience. So are you a person that's growing in sacrificial love? Are you a person that's growing in generosity? Are you a person that pursues purity? Do you care at all about what you say? Do you care at all about what you watch? Do you care about how you treat other people? You see, we can talk about the Bible. We can talk theology all we want. But if ultimately our lives don't change, it's all worthless. Carson says that the Father's will is not simply admired, discussed, praised, debated. It is done. So if someone followed you around all day, even in your private moments, would they conclude that you are someone who follows after Jesus? Do you look like Him? Or do you just talk about Him? These are questions that I constantly need to ask myself. And you see, Jesus raises the heat even further in verse 22. He says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast demons in your name, do mighty works in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me you workers of lawlessness. We live in a world that emphasizes results like profit, like shareholder value, like numbers of followers, like numbers of likes. Um, It's in our Christian world too, right? We we emphasize numbers, numerical growth. We we look at statistics. Um, I remember listening to a preacher who just before he got up, his resume flashes across the screen. And it says 100,000 conversions. Why was that necessary? You see, these people here, they do incredible things for the Lord. They prophesy, they, they, they cast out demons, they do mighty works, they do it all in Jesus' name. It's powerful and it's orthodox. But ultimately, you're not weighed by your public ministry. You're not weighed by your attendance at church, how many you bring to Christ, how many ministries you serve in. These aren't the indicators of true faith, says Jesus. Jesus sees the mighty acts of these people, and yet he calls them workers of lawlessness. Why? Because they never had a relationship with Jesus. He says, I never knew you. And though they did some incredible things for the Lord, their lives did not demonstrate a heart transformation towards obedience to Jesus. Jesus doesn't want your accomplishments. He wants you. And it's your obedience to Him that ultimately reveals where your loyalty lies. So let me ask you again, when's the last time you heard, when's the last time you read God's word and actually made a change? You actually did something about it, not just talked about it. More than a church defined by numbers, by miracles, by dramatic events, would we be a church that is defined by a humble obedience to the word of God? So yes, take these words seriously. Because it would be a tragedy to think that we were Christian all along and then to stand before our Heavenly Father that day and hear the words, I never knew you. We might be able to fake it around people, but before God 
our lives, who we really are, is completely exposed. Lastly, we see two houses. And from the outside, these houses look exactly the same, both beautiful, both clean, impenetrable. But underneath, their foundation will determine their future. Verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. The wise person here doesn't just hear, but does the word of God. And come judgment day, they will stand. But on the other hand, in verse 26, this fool builds with absolutely no foundation, directly on the sand. They hear, but they do nothing. And in the judgment, they will fall. Um, Each of these three illustrations, you'll notice the gates, the trees, these houses, they're essentially the same illustration. In, In this passage, Jesus doesn't give us any new commands. He's already said in this sermon everything that he needs to say. And so now he leaves us with this choice that will determine our destiny. Notice each of these illustrations, it's about the end, right? It's the gate at the end of your life. It's the health of the tree revealed at the end and cut down in eternal judgment. It's this house that stands or falls, that crashes in in these storms of God's final judgment. Jesus says judgment is coming. Hell is real. We don't like to talk much about hell, right? People find it offensive. We don't like to scare people into the kingdom. Some say it's manipulative, right? Um, Li Wenliang, he was a 34-year-old doctor who first alerted the Chinese government to the coronavirus and to its threat. Uh, And sadly, he died uh, a few weeks ago. But when he first alerted the public to the threat of this virus... Um, His posts were immediately taken down. He was reprimanded by the police for spreading rumors, for fear-mongering. He was forced to write a letter rescinding these warnings, acknowledging that he made false comments on the internet. He's accused as a manipulator and as an agitator. But when everyone recognized what he was saying was true, he was labeled a hero. The public now recognize him as a national hero for his efforts in trying to contain the virus. And ultimately, he dies from this disease from an infected patient. Lee absolutely did intend to scare the nation. He did intend to warn them of this threat. But the difference between him being called a fear-monger or him being called a hero is whether what he says is true. The difference between Jesus being manipulative and Jesus being loving is whether he tells the truth. Of course, if hell is fake, if Jesus, if hell is fake, Jesus is just a manipulator. He's just a false teacher like everyone else. But if hell is real, then Jesus' words are absolutely the most loving thing the most important thing you need to hear. The key is not whether or not you like this concept of hell. The question is whether it's true. There's heaps of things in life that we don't like, right? But if they're true, we have to live in light of them. And that's what the crowds recognize. In verse 28, they're astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching as one who had authority, not as their scribes. So this is what you need to decide. Is Jesus a crazy person to dismiss? Or does Jesus speak with an authority that truly comes from God? Unlike these scribes who appeal to higher authority, Jesus claims to be an authority unto himself. And as we look through the Sermon of the Mount, we see teachings that are so ahead of their time, so revolutionary, that promote peace, that promote flourishing in this world that is filled with animosity. 
No, these aren't words of a madman. These aren't words of a fear monger. Jesus' words on the Sermon of the Mount, they're so sophisticated, they're so profound, you have to take them seriously. So as we come to the end of our series, Jesus lives, leaves us with this decision. It's the decision between easy and hard, between fake and real, between foolish and wise. The most tragic thing you could do is just admire His words and resolve just to change a little bit. Just worry a little bit less, maybe. Try and just be a little bit more generous. No, Jesus demands such a fundamental change of your worldview, of your heart. It requires all of you or nothing at all. We don't get to sit here today being neutral. The reason why Jesus is so stern here is because choosing wrongly is so much more than just a shame. It's an eternal tragedy. No, these words, they don't just try and stir up fear, do they? These are words of love directed towards your eternity. It's the big danger sign before falling off a cliff. So the gospel represents a warning. We've heard that today. The gospel also represents an invitation. And in this Sermon of the Mount, Jesus' standards, they are so high, right? That if his ministry ends here, we might be left crippled. But hope arises through where Jesus will finish. And he will finish on a cross where we see the one who endures the full anger, the full judgment of God, so we can be free. We see Jesus as the one who walks this narrow path. He walks this narrow path all the way to the cross so that when we follow him, we don't have to. Jesus is the one who is this tree that's cut down. He's thrown into the fire on that cross so that we don't have to endure it. No, see, the gospel presents us with a warning, yes but it presents us with this incredible opportunity. This opportunity to escape judgment through hearing God's words, trusting in them and living in light of them. So I plead with you today. Today is no other ordinary day. It's a day closer to the judgment of God. Perhaps this is your first time stepping into a church. And you know, you might might not be familiar with the Bible, that's okay. Jesus' words are for you. Trust in Him, you will find life. You might feel right now you don't have all the information you need to make a decision. Yeah, that's fine. But please don't walk out of here doing nothing. But look seriously into Jesus' claims. See whether what He's saying is the truth. Or maybe you're here today, you grew up in church and you grew disillusioned, you fell away. Well, Jesus' words are for you as well. There is always time for a new start in God's kingdom. Jesus invites us, confess our sins, turn to Him in repentance. Or maybe every week you sit here, every week you're here. Jesus' words are for you too. Be sober. Examine your life. Is your life truly characterized by righteousness? Perhaps you've been sitting here, you've realized you've never truly obeyed. You've never truly believed. Well, today is the day to be real and to ask for help from the God who loves to save, who loves to transform. The Rural Fire Service says that during a bushfire, um, people under threat must move to a safe area. And absolutely the safest place you can go is to a piece of land that's already been burnt. Why? Because burnt things can't be burnt again. No matter whether you're an atheist, you're an agnostic, you're a Buddhist, you're a Christian, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a street worker, everyone must give an account before the Lord Jesus. And on that day, the absolutely safest place that we can be is at the foot of the cross. Because the cross is the only place that's already been burnt. 
At the cross, Jesus has taken the fire of God's judgment. At the cross, there is no more to pay. And as you stand before God, you won't hear the words, depart from me, I never knew you. But at the cross, Jesus will show his father the scars on his hands and his feet, and he will say, they belong to me. And what you'll find is the cross doesn't just save, but it has the power to transform even the hardest, the most apathetic heart into one that humbly hears and humbly obeys and follows in the footsteps of our Savior. So let's pray that we would. As our eyes are closed, uh, maybe there's some of you here who want to be confident of eternal life. Uh, maybe deep down, um, you know your life reveals a person who has not yet come to know the Lord Jesus. Well, I want to pray for us, all of those of us now in that situation. Whether you're new here, whether you've grown up here and you've been here for years. So this is a prayer that we can pray together in our hearts. Asking the Lord Jesus to help to save which he promises to give everyone who asks. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, you promise us, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. So that's what we do right now. Lord, we confess that our life doesn't reflect the character of our Heavenly Father. Too many times we fail to live up to these standards. And if we're honest, sometimes we don't want to, we don't care. We're sorry that we're such poor imitations of who you've created us to be. We repent, we turn away from our sin. We ask for forgiveness, that we ask that you would restore us now into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you that salvation is a gift. If we tried to earn this ourselves, we'd end up in hell. We thank you that the cross is the only place that's already been burnt. Thank you that the Lord Jesus, he took our punishment on that cross for our sin. That Jesus lived the life that we should have lived, died the death that we should have died to give us the gift we could never earn. Would we be found at the foot of the cross come judgment day? Please, Lord, transform us to live lives that bear the mark of our Heavenly Father. May our lives be characterized by a simple obedience to your word in gratitude for everything you've done. You promise that everyone who asks, receive. You promise that you always give eternal life to those who ask. So we ask that you would do that right now. That we would experience the joy of being in relationship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.